Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sheung. I am the program lead for Emergency Hospital um, Ready Program, which is a subsidiary of Emergency Response Africa. Um, um, I, I think two years post uh, graduates um, from medical school, I'm waiting for my NYC. Yeah, I, I guess that's all. Uh, so I think the last person is Olao Luwa Olorun Femi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Olao Luwa Olorun Femi. I'm a 500 level medical student at the University of Ibadan. I'm looking for the fastest way to leave clinical medicine. Thank you. Oh, that's interesting. I, I think um, I'll just introduce myself and then our guest, Dr. Emma Dion, will um, have the floor after that. So I am Dr. Lakumi Oguyemi. I am currently serving, currently doing my NYSC. Um, I'm the host of Doctors Without Stats, and I started this because I realized that for quite a number of young doctors, not all of us want to practice clinical medicine, which clinical medicine is not bad, but it's just some things you just don't want to do, and there is not enough access to information about alternate paths. And so that is what brought up Doctors Without Stats, so we can have conversations with people outside of the clinical space. This is our second session. Our first session was with Dr. Ibrahim Yakini, is a medical device innovator. And then we have our second session today with Dr. Emma, who is an epidemiologist. All right, so Dr. Emma, you have the floor. So briefly introduce yourself and then um, you can share with us your career journey so far. And after that, that gone for about 20 minutes. And then after that, we have question and answer session. All right, Dr. Emma. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's, I hope I'm audible. I can hear you. I don't know, can every other person hear? All right. So um, it's my pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, my name is Emma Dion. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. So I'm um, Emma Dion Eko, um, popularly or commonly called Dr. Emma. Um, I'm an epidemiologist, currently working with 54 Gene as clinical data lead, where I oversee the data processes um, in the COVID-19 response nationwide. Um, so um, I've been asked by doctors without stats, because we are currently without stats, correct? So <laughs> to come share some bit of um, what I'll call my career story. Um, it's a privilege for me to do this. And I hope that um, at the end of this process, we can, we can come up with lessons, we can draw um, direction and guidance, and then move on. So um, hi, everyone, again. Um, I'd like to start by saying that um, the future is not here with you. Like, no matter how much you think you've been able to articulate it, no matter how much you've been able to, to plan it in, in such a way that, to plan your present in such a way that um, you have that desired future, um, it's not here with you. It means one of two things. It means that that future can be greater than you anticipate. Yeah, it's very possible. And which is most likely going to be the case if you are aware that we are not in it yet. Um, usually, um, I get asked about how I got here because I meet someone for the first time and the conversation goes, um, what do you do? And I'm like, I'm a doctor. And they're like, we do work. 
and I say I work um, at XYZ, and they say, oh, what hospital is that? And I say, it's, it's not a hospital. I mean, we, we are into different things and different projects. And there's that moment of surprise that follows because, you know, a lot of people cannot understand that medicine is far beyond what happens in the four walls of a hospital. And so I hope that um, in telling my story, um, you will be able to appreciate how I got to this place and um, able to see how that experience can help you and also help me because I also learned from my own experience. And so there are these four questions I always like to ask. Um, the question is, um, how did I get here? It's important to ask this question because um, you need to be able to understand how you got to this point. So whether you're a medical student, you are um, doing your NYC, you've started working already, and you're somewhere, you have to ask yourself how you got here. So I, I always ask myself, how did I get here? And as a 400 medical student um, in 2012, I think we had just finished our part one MB examinations um, not so long before then. And um, I was expecting um, to excel in flying colors because I had invested a lot of hard work. And the results were good. I was impressed. Um, but I asked myself one question. I mean, it is all there is to it. I mean, I passed the MB and it's all. Um, I remember taking a walk from the results board all the way to the canteen. And I was in a moment of deep thoughts. Like, I mean, we've worked so hard and we've written the exams, we've done so well. We had wonderful assessment scores. I mean, this all. Um, and then from that moment, I found myself beginning to ask so many questions about what I really wanted to do after medical school. Um, it was so early. Um, I remember, um, I remember going through so much question and answer sessions even with my colleagues. I still remember going around the class asking everybody what they wanted to do after medical school. And I had so many fond answers. A lot of people wanted to be surgeons, a lot of people wanted to be physicians. And I had another round of questions. I went around asking everybody again. Um, we had a very small class, about 47, so it was easy to ask everybody. Um, I asked again, why are you making this choice? Because I, I was so confused. It seemed like we had just um, filled in that jam form without thinking, you know? And I got a lot of answers. Some people said um, they, they are going to their future because of money, financial reward. Some people also said um, they want more time. A lot of people said they wanted to help people. And some people said they wanted fulfillment. So, uh, but none of, I didn't study medicine for any of these reasons. Um, so I felt like I was in the wrong place. So it, le it led to a lot of introspection. And um, I think I, I began to pay attention more to the things I was, um, I was good in um, as compared to what I was doing, which is why this question is very important. How did I get here? So um, I realized I got here because I wanted to um, I wanted to feel good about myself. I was studying medicine. I, I, I realized I wasn't entirely, um, entirely sincere about purpose at the point of choice. Because you see, it's very important you, you understand that, uh, how, how you made that choice. You know, if you were someone that was very good in school, very good at, um, you probably get asked or probably get directed into medicine by the very nature of the fact that you are good in school. And nobody really cares to pay attention whether you are excellent with numbers that they might just try to wonder, okay, fine, let's, let's leave, let's leave uh, 
uh, the traditional part aside and say, okay, fine, if you're good with numbers, what else can you do? We, we had our career um, guidance given to us that people who had so limited view of the world and the future. And all the new was what was functional in the past, which you agree with me is not so functional now. And so that is how I got here. And I realized I needed to make a change. So I started paying attention to my aptitudes, what I was good in. My mom was doing her master's degree then, and um, her master's was in environmental health management. And she was also working as well. Um, she, was, she was a matron, um, so you can understand how busy she was. So at um, a lot of times, um, she wanted me to pull out resources for her to do her assignments. So there were assignments on climate change, there were assignments on greenhouse gases and all of that. And a lot of those environmental health kind of things. So my first contact with um, what I can say I'm doing now started then. I, I was a 300 level medical student. Um, I was in a lot of interaction with mom. And so I pulled out a lot of resources for her. So in trying to get either articles or um, whatever resources, I was able to get books online for her, um, primarily because there was a knowledge gap in terms of IT, you know, how to use such um, resources to get um, current materials. So that's what I was doing. And I found myself attempting to um, answer some of these questions that were asked. So um, I found myself even volunteering to help her um, articulate some of these um, objectives that were asked from the assignments. And I realized that um, I enjoyed the process, something I enjoyed doing. And I didn't know that that was research. So um, it was very, you could call it, um, it was a very clandestine process, it wasn't very refined, but the purpose was there and um, it was getting done. And so um, that was my first contact with um, research, if you put it that way. So I grew from there to asking her, okay, fine, um, when you want to do the main project work, I would like to be involved. And um, her project was on um, hot food in Oyo Metropolis. Um, and so I devoted myself to be part of that process, um, including contributing financially to it. I was in a couple of scholarships then, so um, some of the money I, so we were like working together, you know, just like our thesis. And so I really wanted to, you know, so I, I got into, um, try to, we tried to understand what the microbial concentration was on the microbial content of hot food was where we were staying. And it was so fascinating to me because we make a lot of statements about um, microbial contamination, but not so much about what those contaminations are. And so, you see, uh, and I realized that there are some questions you just can't answer by own research. And that piqued my interest further. So when I, I got into clinicals and I was mourning the, um, I wasn't feeling exceptional about the fact that I just passed part one MB and I was having that moment of, of sorrow, I decided to tap into something that was more relevant and which was research. So um, I got into clinicals and I started paying attention to the clinical environment. Um, at 500 level, we did obstetrics and gynecology and I was on that posting. I remember we had a lot of, um, a lot of wound dehiscence um, from post um, cesarean sections. I think there were about two in the world um, and the number was increasing. So I started asking questions like, what's, what's the problem? Why are we having, are we having good dehiscence on, on the world? And I, I remember talking to one of the registrars and well, he gave me the test version of the answer I was supposed to expect. Um, I remember going back to, to look at uh, what the possible causes may be. Um, it was just me just having fun with knowledge. Um, as time went on, I, I, I had to approach a consultant and he tried to explain things to me from 
a more knowledgeable perspective, especially with the perspective of what was taking an environment. So I realized that as the hierarchy of knowledge um, was increasing, I also had an increase in um, one, and what was common around us, because I realized the consultant was making a lot of reference to studies that have been done in our environment. And which made me to um, come to this point where I told myself, so there's knowledge and there's relevant knowledge. And for us to arrive at what is at knowledge that is relevant to our surroundings, we have to do research. So I think that was um, what birthed my first um, research. Um, I, I wanted to find out why we're having good decisions on the world. And so um, purely, I just worked with my mom and uh, she was able to guide me through the process. And um, when the paper was published, I can tell you that it was rejected um, because there were a lot of, uh, it was rejected, yes. In the format it was, I was asked to improve it. And after improving it, I was asked to also um, do another research because uh, from my research, um, I realized that the healthcare workers did not understand the, that um, some of the factors that caused me the sense were actually um, what could be responsible for them. So there was a knowledge gap that was revealed by the research and the reviewers asked me to try to understand why this knowledge gap existed. And so, you see, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was very excited that I had just finished one inquiry and another one began. And it was fun to me. This was not garbage in, garbage out with MCQs and, and Viva questions. This was something more interesting. And that was exactly how I got here. I know I have a lot a bit of time, but if I if I really continue on how I got here, it's we're not going to end. But I, I need to make that medical school phase really clear because um I really need to understand how I came to a point where I made the decision that okay, fine, this is where I want to be. Um I was good on the words, so this was not a case of um not being exceptional in the clinical rotations and um trying to find a fail safe mechanism. Um, I, I did exceptionally well um, among my peers. Uh, I could say that because I had a lot of recommendations for residency, in, um, especially in orthopedics. So I, it's actually a field I really loved and I might see myself going to it maybe later in the future. Um, but I came to a place where I told myself that as far as my aptitude is concerned, as far as opportunity is concerned, as far as career growth is concerned, I think I've found what, um, what can take me to where I need to be really fast. And, um, and that's how I, I made that decision. And so, I mean, I think we all do housemanship, right? And during my housemanship, um, we all paid a particular amount of money, not less than 160,000, I suppose. I think there are a couple of pieces that came less than that. Uh, but I think I was paid um, about 170K or thereabouts. I can't, refer, I can't remember because the money was never complete. So, um, so I, I had to invest part of my salary into personal development because that was the only, that was my only source of income. So. I was doing a lot of online courses um, with my salary. I remember this very month, um, I think January, February of, of that particular year, I, I had to do this very course that was so expensive that I had, to, I had to use up all my salary. Like I just got the money and I, I paid it. And um, you know, this is a very emotional story because um, you, are, you, are, you are attending, you are going to work every day with your colleagues and they just cannot understand why you are, why you are broke because we are all getting the same salary, right? But I was very obsessed about what I wanted my future to be like. So, you know, 
I, I was investing more than I was earning into knowledge. And I think some at the tail point of the housemanship, I was applying for a couple of positions and I, I, got, I got a scholarship to do masters. And also it came with um, a fellowship offer um, where I got funding to do research. And this, this came from the World Health Organization. It was a special project on tropical disease research. And um, there are a lot of other um, offers there. They were taking care of my resettlement. I mean, it was a very juicy offer. I was in morning review when I got this offer. And I can tell that at the point where I opened that email, I was no longer interested in what was going on around me. Prior to that email, I was really worried about whether or not they would point me and ask me questions because um, I was on call the previous day and I was so tired that I don't think I could have remembered um, whatever causes of anything they would have probably asked me. So I saw the email and I realized that my life had changed and this was like a golden moment. I realized I had, I was reading the details of the offer and I realized that this was the golden egg. And at that point, I think that was the point where I realized that clinical medicine was going to take a pause. So um, I, the offer was um, something that I did not play with. I was exposed to um, a network of individuals that I, I would say I, I, I did not, I wouldn't have had the privilege of meeting ever in my life. I sat in rooms where I kept asking myself this question, how did I get here? And, um, you know, if you, are, if you trained in, in an NGI university and you are in continental um, platforms where you are the only Nigerian in the room um, and you, you understand where you came from and you, you see um, how, how different life is from what you, are, you were used to, it gives you so much perspective as to what you want your future to be like. And so that was who I was um, while I was doing my master's. Um, I got a lot of training and I got a lot of knowledge. Um, I did not stop investing in knowledge. And I think um, somewhere along the line, I, I, I got my current offer and, um, and this is where I am. So um, what I'm doing currently now is I oversee clinical data management for um, an organization that has equations um, in Nigeria, in UK, and in the United States. Um, an organization that has gotten a lot of support in setting up the biggest um, or the largest private um, lab in Africa that can actually um, fully sequence the human genome. And um, I, I, had, I, I have the opportunity to work with a wide range of teams and a wide range of individuals that um, I, I, I don't even have to uh, attend courses to learn new things. I just interact and we work together and I learn a lot of new things. So I'm learning project management. I'm learning a lot about customer service and sales. I'm learning so much about um, um, project management. Um, so about process for development. Um, my technical skills have evolved and become better defined. And I see myself in the path to get new knowledge. Okay, um, I also want to, so you see, so that is where I came from and, and this is where I am. So I, I am not exactly saying I've arrived yet, um, but I am at where I can see a lot of considerable growth has occurred. So it brings me to the next question, what is keeping me here? And uh, it's very important for us to know that um, we, we came from somewhere, right? So the first thing that's keeping me here is one, um, I came from a place where um, you could not exactly differentiate between mediocrity and excellence. You could be really excellent and you would not be appreciated. I came from a place where there was, I did not see the impact of my hard work on career goal. I did not see the impact of hard work on compensation. I did not see the impact of hard work on benefits. So I really do not want to go back to that place. So that's the first thing that's keeping me here. Not wanting to go back, 
one. Two, and that's coming from a place of knowing where I came from. Also, um, that's, that's number one. Two, and most importantly, remember I said that we do not know the future yet. So um, there's a future I have. I hope to be a professor really soon. Um, and by really soon, I mean in less than 10 years. Um, but, um, so that, that's something, that's the future I'm seeing happening. And it's making me, it's keeping me in this place where I want to move so fast. Um, yeah, because if you work smartly enough, you can actually get to where you're going to, to where you're getting to. I mean, I mean, ask yourself, people that those guys are getting to Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Oxford, the big unis, the ones that have really stellar careers, board certified orthopedic surgeons, spinal surgeons, who make six hundred grand every year in American dollars. They're human beings who are equally as smart as you are. So, I mean. I can also get there. So that's the, that's, that's the future I'm looking at too. So I also want to get there. That question is, what is it costing me? So I also have to be sincere with you about um, what it's costing me. And if, if I'm very sincere, it's, um, it, it takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of hard work. And um, you, might, you might have a lot of, you might have to make a lot of sacrificial decisions. Um, you may not really have the time to enjoy committed relationships the way you would want to. You yeah, may just have a little time to pay attention to everything. It's very possible your, <laughs> your, your partner may leave you. Yes. Um, statistics are showing that a lot of doctors who enter residency um, have, and in the US, I mean, have problems with their personal relationships because they come to a lot of time to their career. So, if you have to drop parallels with that statistic, you can, you can, I can say that um, this has affected me as well. So what is it costing you? And then is it worth it? So I wanted to picture a young medical student, very confused, very, um, who you could say was smart enough to go anywhere, who was also very confused because uh, he wanted to do what was worth it, what was valuable, what, what, what was fulfilling. And then he could just um, make parallels with what I've told you now and ask me if it's worth it. And I'll leave you to answer that question. So, but I just want to answer a couple of other questions um, following this. I hope I've not exceeded my time. I, I, maybe in the event that I have, I want you to forgive me, but I just rushed this. Is it easier? I really think it's not because, um, I mean, anyone would think that, or a lot of people assume that um, people that know me, because I don't talk a lot about what I do, but a lot of people assume that it's easier, but I can really tell you that it's not. Um, life is all about trade-offs. You are not going to have everything, um, you're not going to have everything um, the way the way you want to have them. Life is all about trade-offs. Like, um, if, if you want, you might just want to do this. Um, I may not be on weekend call um, every other week, but um, I can tell you that I might be sleeping by 3 a.m. every other night. So, see, I, I might, so it's, it's all about trade-offs. So is it easier? It's definitely not easier. If you want to excel, I guarantee you have to put in your best. In medicine, it's easy to excel in medicine because you are competing against, or you are competing with people that are, um, you are, you are on the same footing. So all of your medical lessons, you all have MDBS. But the minute you step out of medicine to a, a field that is bigger, that you do not need to have a medical license to work in, I guarantee you that you must bring in your best because people you are also um, competing with because I not I also bring in their best as well. Yeah. And you see, it's it's you don't have that advantage of you need a medical license or you need to be medically qualified to compete here. So it's definitely not easier. Is it better? Um my own personal assessment to be yes. And then um the next question is are there lessons? Um I just want to ask this question back to you. So the question I'll ask you is um how did you get here? So um, I think this is where I pause to ask you 
How did you get here? What is keeping you here? What is it costing you? And is it worth it? So when I say, how did you get here? Um, at what point did you make this decision to come to where you are? You need to evaluate all those factors that made you to make that decision, independent of what is going on around you. And also with what is going on around you to make an informed decision. What is keeping you here? Are you here because you are scared of the future? Are you here because you just want to be comfortable? Are you here because um, of what you've been told? What is keeping you here? What is it costing you? What, 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 where you are and where you've chosen to be, what price is it coming at? What, what, what's it cost? What are you paying for it? Okay, and is it worth it? Um, I'll leave you to answer this question. And so I just want to conclude with you know, these few statements that I've made before. Um, the future is not here in the present. Like, it's really not here, um, for real. It's not here. Um, you can actually be, you know, when I was doing my house job, I had this job that where I used to write down schools I wanted to do PhD in. And you'd see Harvard, you'd see Stanford, you'd see Yale. And I was contacting people in those schools, asking them for their personal statements because I wanted to model my personal statements as they did. I went to see what they were doing. I would go to um, um, university websites, go to faculty, see the exceptional work they were doing in the field I was interested in and tell myself that if I needed to get to this place, if I needed to compete at this level, I need to do stuff like this. So if um, we are using machine learning to make models, um, to inform policy decisions. Um, I think I need to hop on that train, right? And also, when boundaries are gone, anything is possible. So, you see, as far as you have boundaries, um, you can never think beyond those boundaries. You have to let, let the boundaries go, okay? You have to let the boundaries go. You have to not limit yourself. And then you have to let go of something um, to push something greater. Exactly. So um, your future is not here. And sometimes you have to let the present go. Transitions are very ugly. You know, at every point in my career that I wanted to do something big, I had to start afresh. So um, I moved from Uyo to Calabar where I was doing my house job. And you see, when I got to Calabar, I had to start afresh. Like, you know, buy house things afresh, start afresh. Like, and I had I just I just spent not a lot of time in Calabar and I had to move again. And when I, each time I moved, I started afresh. So even when I I went to Ghana to do my masters and the WHO fellowship, I I had a very ugly transition. And but you have to keep your eye on the goal. And then I missed chaos life opportunity. I feel this I can't really stress this enough. I think one of the most important lessons of my career, which I must try to, I, must, I can't fail to not mention, is that whenever there is chaos around you, that is not the time to panic. That's the time to ask yourself, where is the opportunity? Because trust me, there's always an opportunity. Um, I, I don't want to say a lot about this, not to take a lot of time, but just try to remember that. Whenever there's chaos around you, ask yourself, where is the opportunity? And then invest your efforts smartly. Yeah, that's true. Um, you only have one life. Um, really, you have one life. And you don't have all the time in the world. You all have to fire, so you have to invest efforts smartly. And then um, I think this is the one of those things I want to ask. Do you want a logical story or do you want excellence? Yeah. Do you want a logical story? Or do you want excellence? Details lead to discovery, very important. Um, let me just mention here that at the inter, where two parts cross, okay, so you're yeah, medicine, right? But where medicine meets with another field, innovation is born. Innovation is born. At this point, a lot of the innovation that, has, that is needed to sustain us in this century has already been done. I don't think there's any new innovation that will happen now that will sustain us in this century. That means in your lifetime, 
if you discover anything new, it's very likely going to help the next generation. And so, you see, you have to partner with another field. So medicine has to meet something else, right? Okay, good. So let me just pause there and say that um, I, I made a detour in my life. Um, not necessarily a detour, but if you just call it a detour, but I made a detour and I, I, I stumbled on something big. And I, would, I want you listening to me to, to join me. Um, not in my path, but uh, in my journey. I'm not, I'm not saying you should join me in my path. Don't come and also say, okay, fine, I want to be an epidemiologist too. That's not why I'm, I'm giving you this story. I'm just saying that whatever that field is, and even if, it's, if you want to be a spinal surgeon, um, just join me in the place where you tell yourself that as far as this dream is concerned, I want to be at the top of it. I want to be have global record, and I want to sit in rooms where decisions are being made. Okay, so I don't have taken a lot of time, but I have to just hold my breath here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Emma. Like, this was actually a really brilliant storytelling. Actually, was surprised to see that you had a slide presentation ready for us, and that shows that like it took time to really prepare for this. So thank you so much. Um. So now I hope we are all here, and we didn't just like join and then go off. So can anybody? mention are you around are you here yeah i'm here elizabeth uh, call her day. Call her day here. yes 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 i'm here okay. all right so what uh, so we all had this story and it was quite inspiring really so um i think now we're supposed to go into the question and answer session and I think it would be really nice if we could maybe show our video and then actually say our questions as opposed to just putting them in the chat box. So um, you can raise your hand if you have any question to ask probably anything about the story that you shared or if you have your own questions that you came prepared with. All right, so Kola Day has a question you can Unmute your mic and ask your question. Sorry, I don't have any question. Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you just okay. All right. Does anyone have any question? Okay. Um, Martin. Um. Good. Good afternoon. Or good morning, rather. So, um, can I go ahead? Yes, you can. My question to Dr. Emma, thank you very much for that um, presentation, sir. So you are working in, I'm sorry, what exactly was your master's in, sir? And like, what were the fact, I know different um, scholarship programs have different things that are the criteria they are looking at for, for you to get into their program. But, at the same time, are there um, common features that run through all scholarships? I'm, I'm quite sure there are some particular things that most scholarship programs will look at for you to get in. And then, um, in your experience, would you say it's easier to get a scholarship program for non-clinical medicine rather than clinical medicine? I mean, what's, what would you say there's a high probability of getting a scholarship in, sir? Those are my first two questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, can, I, can I respond? Yes, you can. You can. So the first question is what, um, uh, okay, uh, what did you say? What masters, what, what were your masters? Okay, what masters uh, in okay, did you do? Let me just put it that way, and then clinical versus non clinical, right? Yeah, there were three questions one was about what the scholarships look out for, yeah. very important question, 
something I really want to answer. Uh, let's flash it. Look out for. Okay, so I'll just start with the first. So I, I did my master's in epidemiology and disease control. Um, it's an MPH degree, um, but focus on epidemiology and disease control. So the program is structured in such a way that um, from the beginning of the program, you have four departments. So the people that wanted to do like population and family health, they do that wanted to do virus that, um, sorry, um, uh, health, economics, and all of that. But I focused in epidemiology, biostatistics, and disease control. So from the outset, from the get go, that's your specialization. Um, and uh, how did I come to that decision? Uh, I think at the time of uh, choosing that, I had already had two other offers. I think I had a master's, uh, this MSc in global health delivery. I had from a um, particular school in East Africa, uh, just full scholarship too, like everything catered and paid for. And there was another one um, from Europe as well. But I chose to go to Ghana to do this very masters for two reasons. One, it was exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to do, I've always wanted to do epidemiology. So it's very easy to make that decision. And two, this masters was for just one year. Um, I think the other one was for um, 18 months or two years or thereabout. But this was the shortest one and I really wanted to get it over with. So um, what scholarships, what, what, what to look out for? I, I think you should look out for, um, so every scholarship is different. Let me just put it that way. And you have to know, know what each scholarship wants. Um, so um, let's talk postgraduates now. Let's look on the graduates. Let's talk postgraduates. So if, for example, you are applying for a Commonwealth scholarship, I'll, I'll say Commonwealth because a lot of us have applied for Commonwealth. You'd see that they have a criteria where they used to assess you. So they'll tell you that, okay, fine, they have these essays they want you to write. And the essays, they use it to assess how you are well able to articulate what your um, what they expect from you. So they have things like development impact statements. They have things like asking you to talk about your short or long-term goals. And all they're trying to do is just trying to see how your goal aligns with theirs. Every organization has a strategy, has a goal. I'm telling you, every organization has a goal. I, I think I, I had, no, I think, I actually had a PhD scholarship last year at the University of New South Wales um, to do a PhD in medicine. And um, part of applying for that scholarship, I was asked by my supervisor to align my career strategy, my career goal with the strategy of the program. So the program also has its own strategy. They have yearly strategies. So you have to be able to read sometimes. So if you are applying for a scholarship, don't just look, look beyond what the eligibility is just go to the sponsor's website, try to know what their goals are, what projects they are willing to fund. Do you understand? Try to know what areas they are willing to um, give opportunities in because there's opportunity everywhere, but just want to focus on this. So if they want to focus on neglected tropical diseases, you just put yourself there. You understand? Just, I'll give an example. The master's I did in Ghana was, the focus was on neglected tropical disease. And nobody wants to research neglected tropical disease, like for real. There's a lot of poor research output in that area. And there's no encouragement to research there because I mean, who's going to cite you? Because nobody wants to research there. But they want to now say, okay, fine. We want to encourage people to research more in this area. So we're giving grants, we're giving funding, we're giving research packages, we're giving scholarships. So you can just take advantage of it. And so my, 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 my answer to that question is, yeah, of course, beyond what the scholarship looks out for, look beyond what they've told you. Go and do some little research around them. A, an example, let me just give an example. Commonwealth, the, the British government that funds Commonwealth, they have priority areas where they fund. These priority areas may not be apparent in the call for application that you read on the 
um, when you read it. But it's definitely there on their websites. When you go there, you look at the priority areas, and you will see why two people can have the same nice application, wonderful essays, but they're picking one person because that, that person will say, okay, fine, I want to focus more on epidemic disease response. And this other person will say, okay, I want to focus on um, nano engineering. So you see, I don't even understand what I'm saying. They're clinical versus non-clinical. Well, um, that is not a question I can answer because I have not, I have not, I'm not been private to um, where the decisions are being made. But from experience, I will, I can tell you that if you are more likely to find opportunities where there are gaps, and if there are gaps in non-clinical areas, you are likely to find scholarship opportunities more in non-clinical areas, which you can take advantage of. This is not to say that you can take advantage of this and neglect your clinical career totally. You can do a master's in epidemiology and still be an orthopedic surgeon. But what is going to happen is that you're going to be a very good orthopedic surgeon because not only would you know your clinical parts very well, when it comes to research, you can be really good. I mean, because you already have the expertise in that area. And so you know a lot about data and numbers. So when it comes to giving us evidence-based knowledge on best common clinical practices, people will want to listen to you. I hope you understand. So um, I, I don't think a point where you're trying to make a career detour is not where you have, where you make preferences. Um, just an advice, not a suggestion, but you can, you can try to marry both. You can't, you don't have to restrict yourself at this point. You can try to take one and just a practical advice. You can simply find, you can get a clinical education, a non-clinical education, and see how to make it useful to your clinical career long term. Okay, and just because, just in case you are worried about what options are available to you right now. Okay, All right. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Emma. Right, just before we move on to the next question, um, there's something I want to ask about what you just shared. So, okay. yeah, I, you mentioned that you, you got a PhD scholarship last year. I think I actually saw that on Twitter. I think it was, okay. I don't know if it was early this year or last year. I can't remember now. Well, last year, but, last year. But at the moment, at the moment, you are not doing a PhD. So yeah. I just want to add, like, can you share maybe a reason why, I don't know, did you reject the scholarship or did you defer and whatever it is, okay. like, is there a reason why you're not okay. on it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, it, I think it's also a very important story to tell because um, it's good to also know, like, it's good to also know the sacrifices we make. I think November, about October, October, October last year, I was just on my bed and um, no, I was on my bed. I was, I had not come back then. I was, in the, I was at this club having fun and I got an email and I had to leave the club immediately. And what was the email? The email was congratulations. You have been, you know, giving this offer. And it's a very nice offer. Um, T-shirt all catered for um, with, uh, I think, what is salary or what? Or what I don't know what they called it, but it totaled about um, fifty thousand dollars a year or so. Oh no! And then I um, came with visa opportunities for for both me and should in case I want to come with family, I can do that. So it was a very nice offer, and I engaged it immediately. Uh, what happened was, um, it's I I started applying for the visa and all of those things. And I think that was November, December, when the COVID happened. COVID happened, I think the first COVID, December, yeah. So December, we started hearing something about something happening in Wuhan, China. And um, by then, my, I think my, doc, my, my visa documentation was complete and I, was, I started engaging. And I think by February, and where I was expected to hear back from where I had applied to, um, I was, we're not hearing news about um, lockdowns uh, globally. And I think at this time, COVID was acknowledged as a pandemic. Universities had started shutting down. And 
there was that cloud of unpredictability around what would be my future. So, um, so it was a very trying moment for me, though. Uh, but I just had to hang on to the fact that I had up to September to sort myself out. And the closer as we get to September, the more unpredictable the the cloud of um, the cloud of uh, what, what what will happen to to what what's going to happen now because. I was not even told this is what you had to do. Um, but I think there was an alternative. I had a very good relationship with my supervisor then. And she said that, um, that this is what the university is saying. This is what we can do. We have an alternative where you can, you can do this from Nigeria. Um, but you, we need to meet a couple of conditions. And if we meet those conditions, by the deadline, we'll be able to um, get you again on board. So I was okay, fine. I, by this time, I already had a job and I wasn't really interested in traveling anymore. So I could kill two beds with one stone. But in Nigeria, we had lockdown. I couldn't exactly go to where I needed to get things done. Um, basically, the pandemic fucked up my, oh, sorry, sorry to use the F word. The pandemic messed up my life. <laughs> Um, pandemic actually messed up my life, like really messed it up. And um, I was able to have another conversation with the university to have a different arrangement that will still give me what I want. And uh, I'm, I'm not privy to disclose uh, that yet, but that is an example of um, how things just happen and um, what was in your hand just leaves. But um, I think the consolation in all of this was. Um, in spite of all that happened, um, um, the career path was, I did not let it go. I think an, an, an advice I have to give to anyone here right now is, at some point in your career, you have to prioritize between whether you actually want more education or more work experience. Very important. I'm sure that a lot of us want to have a lot of education um, because I think it, validates us, right? So, I mean, having a PhD is a natural thing to do when you've done your master's. But you should ask this question, do you really need it? What do you need? You are in your early to, um, early, okay, let's say late 20s to early 30s. And um, there's a point where you have to ask yourself, what is important to me? What is my goal? And what do I do? So if you want a career in academia, I will advise you by all means, go get that PhD, right? But if you look at industry and say, ah, industry is fun. Like, I mean, I get to solve new problems every day. Oh, trust me, I've had a taste of both. I've, I've had a taste of academia and I've had a taste of industry. So if you say industry, um, there's, there's fun working in the industry because you solve new problems every day. You're not bored. You, 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 you communicate across a wide range of professionals, um, and um, you are allowed, you have that allowance to, to, to work your own ideas, you see? So if you're that kind of person, I, I don't think you would want to go with a PhD, right? But if you're someone that says, okay, fine, I mean, I really love academia, I want to do this, I hope it's gone. But for me, I think I came to a point where I said, okay, fine, even if they brought the PhD, I still will not go and do it. Because I came to realize that um, career became exciting. Um, I was solving problems that were real, that made meaning to people. You know, when you do research, you publish papers and you have those recommendations for policy. And during when you're summarizing, you're saying things like um, you expect that um, the program managers of the WHO MBT leprosy chemotherapy are going to consider patients and um, maybe uh, facility-related factors when they are trying to scale up their interventions. You're saying things like that in your paper. But you see, industry is different. Um, you are the one making the decision. You are the one asking the questions, how do we scale this up? And then you are the one um, engaging a team and saying, okay, fine. Um, okay, um, communications, how do we get communications? to improve uptake of MDT. 
you are engaging tech and say tech what technical infrastructure can we bring on board to improve this scale up we are engaging project management how can we initiate and sustain and you're having a lot of conversations at the same time and you're actually driving the change in real time see that is what i came to meet in the industry and that's why i choose to stay so I wasn't so keen on doing the PhD any longer, but there's a new commission around that currently, but um, I'm not privy to share. Um, maybe when everything is clear, I might share, but my priority right now is my current job. Thank All right. you. Thank you. That was actually enlightening. Thank you for that. Um, do we have any other question? Any other person? All right, uh, Martins, you can you can ask. Okay, thank you, sir, for the advice and the talk this morning. It's very inspiring. So my question is concerning the admission process. Now you said you get admission in East Africa and then one in Ghana, but. During NYC, I've been talking with some guys who are also interested in having, you know, going to academic, study master, and PhD. So we've been trying to look for admission in mostly UK universities and Canada and other sources. And you said earlier that if it is not in medical uh, program, that the competition is actually very high. So because most of the uh, uh, courses we are applying for are like things like uh, demography and uh, and health, health economies, uh, global health and development, which are open to people that are non medical uh, people. So, and in fact, sometimes we apply to four universities, like three people at, 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 you know, applying to different universities and they don't even get the admission. And it was at the point very tiring. So, but now when you were talking, you talk about you doing some programs before actually going for the masters. And I kind of pick a insight in that maybe there should be some additional qualification apart from MBCHB. So what I'm asking is that is the MBCHB alone enough to secure admission for you know for all these uh, postgraduate uh, programmer MSc particularly outside the country, and for some of my guys, some of them even do PGDs in education boards. Nigeria, National Open Universities, PGD in economics. So even despite those additional stuff, they were already getting the admission, not even talk of scholarship. So I want to please talk more on the admission. Or should we just look outside to other Africa countries and maybe we should just apply them? That's the question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So you see, I have to see. good. Did you see that? MBBS not enough. Okay. You are very correct. I like, I like. I like the fact that you've come to that realization because it's really important. You see, when we were in, when we were in, when we were in university, we, we were really pampered by school, and um, school um, made us believe that we're the cream of the crop. They tried the cream of the pack, like we're like the best of everybody. And well, true, and also not true. True because um, significant investment is put into training you, but not true because when you come out in the real world, you face that competition, especially if it's outside of medicine, okay? So um, I want you to understand that, first of all, the minute you decide to apply for a scholarship, you've chosen to compete, right? Um, in medical school, where you're used to competing against the past mark, yes, that was something that was very, that was part of, I, I mean, a worst case scenario, we could just hit 50, come out, right? But you see, the minute you take that oath and then you're like, given that license, um, whatever it is you make out of your life is up to you. And that includes um, going as far as anywhere, right? And so if you choose to um, go up, like when you mentioned development, right? You go choose to go to development, you choose to go to global health, you are going to, to compete not just with your medical colleagues, right? The people who have also had significant investment in their in their career and 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 not you were in school for at least six seven years. By the time you're doing NYC, it's probably eight years, right? But yes. yeah, but these guys they finished four years, and if you give them the same time, they probably would have um, probably had an additional degree, 
and uh, or additional training. Do you understand? So you are catching up. That's the point. You are you are catching up. So if you have resources at your disposal, I feel the part, the place where you finish medical school around NYC house job, that's the place to define your career. That's 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 the, so whatever investment you have to so study. So try to understand where are you going to so if you're going to development, what part of development are you going to? If you are going to public health, for example, you see, uh, I think there's this mistake that is being made. You say public health, you know, the very funny word you just straight around, you know. So, so what are you going to do in public health? Are you are you going to do are you going to population health? Are you going into health economics? Because if you for each place you are going into, I will tell you that like put your efforts in this direction because you are likely going to have um, opportunities here. I chose epidemiology because that was a very smart decision to make at the time. Epidemiology is at the center of evidence-based medicine. Do you understand? That's why I chose it. I you see it's at the center. You cannot make um, you cannot make um, some a decision based on what is called a fact that has been researched and agreed upon without talking about design, without talking about data. It's impossible. So if they're telling us that you have a new vaccine for COVID, you are going to definitely be supporting with numbers, numbers such as 99 or 95% um, um, efficacy, you understand? So, so those numbers are arrived at by statistical processes, which usually um, are, you know, are seen or are, are done by people who had training in epidemiology. I don't even understand. So I wanted to be a statistical epidemiologist and I realized that if I had to compete, I'll give you an example. There's a scholarship that was um, in a particular university in the UK, I'll not mention the name, but it was in um, epidemiology and statistics. And I realized that the criteria favor people who, have, who, has had, who have had significant background in statistics statistics and mathematics. So I told myself that see, I'm already disadvantaged. The, already, my transcript does not help me. If you bring my transcript, you just see the community medicine. Like it's so undefined that they didn't even make attempts to even tell us, tell anyone that I did about statistics somewhere in year two or year three or year five, or that I've had some modules in epidemiology. So already I'm a victim of my system. So but I have to help myself, right? So you, you saw me, I, I took a lot of courses in statistics. And um, so, so I think if you're interested in a particular field, you should try to take a lot of further training in that field um, from the comfort of your own bed or from, you can just be doing it regularly when you don't need it. I'm a fan of seeking knowledge when you don't need it. Seek the knowledge when you don't need it. So that by the time you, you need it and you are either compiling your CV or asking yourself, why would they take me? At any point in making a scholarship application, you should be able to ask yourself, okay, fine. Why would they take me? You might compete with someone that schooled in um, Makaya University, uh, for example, or with someone that schooled in the University of Wiswatarand in South Africa. What will be my ranking? The WHO scholarship I got, I, I ranked second um, in an African cohort, and um, I was only enjoying in that cohort. And that was because at the time of applying for that scholarship, I asked myself, what would make them pick me? So I arrived at a couple of answers. One, I needed to show that, that I had interest in neglected tropical diseases. So I had to ensure that um, I was, um, so. I, I, I highlighted those interests that even when I was not even um, doing in neglected tropical diseases, uh, for example, I was not studying leprosy, I was not studying. The first time I ever researched about neglected tropical disease was when I had the grants. So even if I had that interest, I was also interested in studying in populations that are not, um, that don't receive interventions regularly. We call them underserved populations. So. See that you have commitment to this field. That's one. Two, they also want to see that you have the capacity to undertake 
independent scientific inquiry. They call it research, but I want to define it as that. It depends, you, you can independently, nobody wants to always say, okay, fine, um, do, uh, okay, just assume you get a master's scholarship and your supervisor tells you, okay, fine, send me a draft of the problem statement around the, um, around the uptake of, uh, let's say, uh, isonazide prevention therapy, uh, EPTP, for example. Just give me literature around it. Give me uh, the problem statements uh, with this population you defined. And you see, that person is supposed to wake up to something from you, not wake up to you asking him or her, how do I go about it? The typical expectation of a postgraduate student is independent scientific inquiry. And the most common predictor of this is previous inquiry. So you need to be able to show that you have undertaken scientific inquiry in the past and they've led to successful conclusions where you can say something like either papers or presentations. So you have to show this, okay? And then, no, there's not a lot of interest around your medical school record. Um, I said there's not a lot. I'm not saying it doesn't come into play when they're trying to screen people out, but I'm not saying there's not a lot because at the point where you are at PG level, the, you, the interest in, is more in your ability to begin and complete successfully than in what you've done. They might only refer to your previous records to see that you are, you are not too bad, right? I mean, I, no matter what happened in medical school, they just want to see that you'll be able to finish. So if you're able to finish, there's not an issue. Um, I mean, you don't necessarily have to be the best in your class to have a scholarship. So they also need to see that you have um, aptitude towards solving problems in your environment. This could be true volunteering. This could be true um, you voluntarily taking up um, roles where you can fix gaps in your surroundings. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that is fashionable can be something that is practical, can be something that's small, as far as your goal was well-defined, as far as um, you were able to achieve that goal, and as far as the impact was felt and was measurable, so why not? So um, these are some of the things, I know people don't really talk about this part of scholarships, but it's something that if you want a scholarship next year, I think you should start working on it this year and ask yourself if I want to be if I want to be, if they were left to select one person and it was just me, how would I prove to them that I am worthy of this scholarship? And then whatever it would take to get to that point, do it. Okay? I think that's just how I'll answer that question. Thank you so much, Dr. Emma. Thank you very much for your response to that. Um, we're actually way past our time but i think it's been it's been really it's been worth it so far really um dr onokaya has his hands raised so i think does any other person have a question so we can just have those two those two questions at once so we know that that those are the last questions you know dr onokaya has one i saw Olaolu's hands raised earlier but i don't know if he still has a question or if yeah, I feel Hello. Okay, so um, Dr. Onokaya and Olaolu, I think you both can ask a uh, question. Dr. Onokaya first, then Olaolu, and those are the last two questions which are going to use to close. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Kumi, um, for this uh, avenue, and thank you, Dr. Emma, for uh, taking our time to educate us on the process. Um, basically, the question I wanted to ask was about uh, development. You said um, that, yes, you did develop yourself, you're taking a lot of courses, but I think um, from the last question, you are able to build on that very well, and, and I, I think you've answered my question already. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, all right. So this question is somewhat of a personal nature. I mean, I'm still trying to find my direct path and all. But um, if I'm, for example, looking to get into the niche where, well, okay, for a quick background, I mean, 
I might be wrong, but to the best of my knowledge, we don't have so much data driven decision making in Nigeria. I mean, in the Nigerian health sector. But if I wanted to get into a niche where I'm combining, um, say, data analytics, all these big data, this new emerging field in software, basically, and um, health sector. I'm to the best of my knowledge again, I might be speaking from a point of ignorance. Would would you say a an MSc in data analytics or big data or an MSc in um an MPH rather in epidemiology and about statistics would come in handy? And I, I know this is not your niche, but just from the little experience you have, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Um I will be very I, I'm I'm happy to disappoint you. <laughs> Yeah, because that exactly is my niche. That's actually what I'm doing. Um, yeah. So, um, but just just to, I understand where you see, it's good where you are answering a question from, you, you, you are listening to the question and you're able to relate to it practically. You see, he, he started by asking that, saying that there are not, there are not a lot of data-driven decisions being made in healthcare in Nigeria. And, um, well, maybe before, maybe before I started my current job, I would say, I would say yes. Um, however, um, so something has happened in this country that has, that has helped, that has, that has touched on the future of public health. And um, let me just give you a snapshot. I think as far as Nigeria is concerned, we've been able to, what the, the epidemic response that we've had to COVID has been able to significantly revamp models that could be used for epidemic control in other areas. Um, I can tell you that um, when it comes to the numbers concerning the pandemic, um, the sophistication around the technology around it is insane. Like it's really insane. And I, I, I never could believe that something of this scale could happen in Nigeria. And it's so big and so amazing that We've grown to this place where um, you could actually go out and study data science and choose to come back home and make a real impact. There'll be a place for you, I guarantee it. So, but to choose between epidemiology and, and data, um, I think there was a point I even wanted to do both because I thought that I had assumed that um, that's after I had the master's in epidemiology, I was still interested in big data. So I wanted to do both. But I came to realize that, come on, you see, you just school. Ah, what do you think masters is? It's to sit down in class, right? And get the lectures. Of course, there'll be a couple of institutions that I'm exposed to knowledge and skill, which happened to me. And I'm grateful for that. Um, but however, when it comes to solving problems in the real world, beyond the knowledge you've gotten from the four walls of an institution, it will be done real situations and real i mean that's that's how it's 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 going to be accomplished and so if you say okay fine i'm torn between these two choices and i want to make one i'll tell you what i did i choose epidemiology and i choose to learn data science through courses so i have a lot of certifications or certificates as you may see from learning um from a lot of these courses. As I'm talking to you now, I'm undertaking a course on advanced Python, like advanced data analytics using Python. Like that's what I'm currently doing. I I do it, I have it's in, it's in my calendar, 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. every day. So I'm giving myself the time to finish it. And so you can see that. And also, no matter where you are, the knowledge you have, the minute you use that knowledge to solve the problem around you, somebody will notice you. Before you know it, you'll be the go-to person to solving that problem. And before you know it, you might either be pivoted to a place where that solving that problem becomes a responsibility, and this is always going to come with benefits. So whether it's epidemiology, whether it's big data, whatever it is, whatever is the easiest way to plug yourself to where you get that knowledge and have proof that you have it, just go ahead and do it. You understand? Exactly. Now, finding a path is as hard as it is. Sometimes it can be easy if you let go. So 
just let go of whatever it is you think you know about everything and approach each field with an open mind. Just assume you don't know anything yet and just seek the knowledge. When you seek the knowledge, you will come, knowledge will come with exposure to skill. And as you advance in skill, opportunities will grow. And at the end of the day, the question will not be, is it epidemiology or is it big data? The question will be, am I happy or not? I, I think that's the most important question that everybody should ask and try to answer um, as we try to do all of this. And I think that's how I'll end that question. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Emma. I'm telling you this was going to be an interesting session, but I think it was way more interesting than I anticipated. And I'm sure every other person that was attentive throughout this call will attest to that. So we are over 30, we are like 35 minutes past our time, although we didn't start till 11.15 because we didn't have a lot of time. And so we have come to the end of the second session of Dr. Dutta's Ted's conversation. And I'm sure everybody like got one or two things or probably like five if we're being honest. So I'm thankful for everyone that joined in. If you want to tweet or like post anything as regards this conversation, you can mention us on our social media handles. I think I put that in the chat box at DWStats on Twitter and Instagram. And on LinkedIn, we are Doctors Without Steps. And you can also send an email to Doctors without steps at gmail.com. Um, and then going forward, we actually have plans to um, add a mentorship session to our program because we realize that sometimes we get information, but then we don't really know what to do with them. So more information will be shared on that, also through our social media pages. So please make sure to follow us and also invite most of your other friends who you think will be interested in this. So with that, we have come to the end of today's session. Thank you very much, Dr. Emma, for honoring the invitation. And thank you everyone for joining. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate right. it. Thank you very much. So, please, can we get the handle of the um, facilitator? Um, okay. You can check him on LinkedIn. Is um, I don't know if you saw the flyer. His full name is on the LinkedIn. On the flyer, his full name. So, he's um, active on LinkedIn. However, for his social media handle, I'm not quite sure about that. I think he's private there, but I'm not sure if I will contact him and ask if he's open to sharing that. If he does, then I will share it. I may not be able to share directly with some people, but most um, probably mention him on our social media page um, before the end of the day if he agrees to that. I hope that works. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Okay.